Why could you go kata? Why could you give up it? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another show known as Media Watch. I'm your host, Dr. Savvy, and with me I have Shamshir Singh from the Sikh Research Institute. Welcome again, and we look forward to seeing you every week. And the purpose of the show is, I guess, into four parts. The first part, really, is to look at a major headline. Secondly, looking at news around the world. And thirdly, we look at seed news. And following on from the seed news, we want to make sure that we understand uh, all there is about our heritage. So we look back in history uh, this time, this week, some time back, to understand and learn more about Sikhs and the rich heritage that we've actually got. So coming back to the main, pep main purpose of the show, the main purpose of the show is to reach out to the mainstream, to understand more around what's happening around the world, and to provide a new summary, more about commentating, less about being critical, but being more aware of what's actually happening and the impact that it has on our lives. So interestingly, one of the biggest headlines of the week is the major shake-up, or the implied shake-up, of the political system by the winning of the UK Independence Party known as UKIP. And I'm sure Nigel Farage, who's the leader, is very pleased with himself with regards to the result because it looks like he wiped out the competition. And I saw down here, in terms of some of the research that I did, that it was something like the first time in 110 years that you see a party come from nowhere to uh, top the polls. Now, I found it very interesting also that Nick Griffin, who happens to be the leader of the British National Party, that represent quite a lot of fascists, had an interesting thing to say. He turned around and said the reason why he had lost his votes in terms of for his party was because the, the racist policies of the UKIP party. I find that quite amusing. And there's an old English expression for that, isn't there? Yes, the pot calling the kettle black. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, there are many connotations to that as well. Now, we also see that that particular rise seems to be common across Europe and let alone the ticket that the Modi government actually have now kind of risen on, which is to use the word Hindu and nationalist in the same context. I don't know. I thought they were just nationalists because they all look after the same country and the same people that live in there, no matter what state they are. But coming back to the UK for a second, uh, we see that the Liberal Democrats uh, almost got wiped out. Labour only just in London actually managed to kind of screech a little bit ahead. And then we have the Conservatives that came third. Let's return to the point about the rise of the, the right wing. Very dangerous in my view. Um, we see, for example, the National Front in France have topped the polls there. Um, we also see the Danish party in Denmark seem to be rising to the right. What's your view on that, uh, Shimshed? Do you think it's dangerous that we see a kind of um, a rise of the right wing? Yeah, um, definitely. We're seeing it all across Europe, as you're saying. Um, there was a, a recent survey, um, the British Social Attitudes Survey, that found that one in three of British people confess to a racial prejudice. So I, I don't know, maybe it's got something to do with the economy or maybe it's got something to do with immigration and, and the, uh, the ghost of mass immigration. But Britain is turning into a slightly more racist country. Mm. So it, it is definitely worrying for us. I mean, so we're such a visible minority. So, yeah, it's definitely worrying. And after 9-11, you see that sex becoming a target in North America uh, and in Europe. So it's, it's um, a cause for concern for us. Well, I think there's, there's two points that you mentioned here. One is there's a, a slight confusion about, um, I guess, what is the definition of there's religion, there's culture, there's there were kind of weird words like tolerance and stuff. Yeah. Um, if people have come over to the UK, whether it be in the 50s, 60s, 70s or whatever, in multiple waves then effectively they become part of that country uh, and there's a fusion of culture. There's a, there's a difference in the way in which uh, that culture that was there before uh, becomes something else. And, and the whole multicultural uh, aspect is that, you know, there's a strength through diversity. Yeah, I mean, the survey um, that I looked at also found that it was within inner London that the attitudes of racism were at their lowest and West Midlands was at its highest, uh, no criticism of West Midlands there, but right. um, it's you see the diversity in a large city like London, you're, you're bound to see it, but you go outside of London um, 20, 30 minutes and you, 
we've all, we almost forget living in London that the majority of the country is still white and the minorities in this country are you know very small compared to the general population. Okay so you think it's just kind of like an impression yeah. that is given rather than the actual yeah. fact in terms of data itself? Yeah and maybe uh, maybe this uh, integration maybe it's backfiring because you see more integration um, and, and so-called diversity on the news or media um, and those uh, um, perceptions are carefully crafted by uh, people that have a vested interest. Um, and maybe that's alienating um, the majority white population of this country that feel that their country is now becoming uh, a, a landing base for immigration from all over the world. Well, clearly, if you look at all the parties in terms of the way in which they campaigned in the European election, uh, there was um, a slant towards kind of, you know, preserving sovereignty and all the rest yeah. of it. I found an interesting statistic here that uh, just as when we were talking last week about the Modi election win, uh, in this case, in the UK, we found that the turnout was only 33.8%. So it's obviously not very high. And out of that, we found that only 9% of, of the voting population uh, actually supported uh, the actual party. So, you know, you can, you can rise, yeah. uh, even a minority can help a minority. It sounds a bit weird, doesn't it? <laughs> you know? um, let's move on to the next part of the programme where we talk about world news and uh, let's first cover off the first bit of uh, news that came out recently that there is supposed to be an EU presidency just on that note about Europe and uh, possibility of President Blair. That's quite interesting isn't it? Yeah, um, for some people might find that quite scary but yeah. I know, good luck to him anyway. Um, we also see that uh, there's a development with regards to the Boko Haram. Uh, this was what we reported last week when we were talking about the uh, Nigerian uh, situation with the kidnapped girls. Now, the Nigerian government has called off a deal with regards to the schoolgirls because at a last minute uh, situation it kind of fell through in terms of uh, a deal that they were trying to put forward. Air Marshal uh, Alex Bidet told demonstrators supporting the country's much criticised military on Monday, uh, that's uh, literally this week, that Nigerian troops can save the girls, according to the Associated Press. But he added, we can't go in and kill our girls in the name of getting them back. So obviously it's a really high risk, high difficult situation in terms of the way in which they're, they're held. Uh, he spoke to thousands of demonstrators who d marched uh, to the Defence Ministry headquarters in Abuja, the capital, uh, and many were brought in on buses. Now there is a comment made in the press about the fact that this may have been an organised event. Uh, maybe an organised in the negative sense or organised in the positive sense. Uh, it's up to you to decide that. Was it a political move uh, to say that something's been done? Or was it really uh, people coming out and saying, we really need to do something? Ultimately, the result is that there hasn't been any of them in terms of being recovered or the situation moving forward uh, in a positive way. Uh, we also note that um, Casa Aid are over in the Balkans uh, because there's been major floods over there. I think they've had effectively three months of rain in just a few days, so it's very bad. Um, and this is based on uh, measurements that were taken over the last 120 years. We see that at least 40 people have died and thousands more have been displaced uh, and our hearts uh, go out to them in terms of um, hoping that you know, they can recover from that. Now in, in the UK we know last year the, the flood situation was really bad and Castle Aid were really good in terms of going out to Somerset and helping them out and taking that initiative which is what Sikhs actually do. So let's uh, move on to another part of the show which really talks about the uh, world news with regards to Sikhs. Um, did you hear about the uh, situation in Karachi with the uh, Pakistani Sikh Council? Yeah, yeah, they're um, calling um, for strict action to be taken against the miscreants that have desecrated the sroops of uh, Sri Guru Granth Sahib Ji. Um, there's been seven incidents reported um, in the south of the country. Um, so it's obviously a, a very serious problem. I mean, they had to storm um, government buildings to try to get their point across. Um, so it's, uh, it's a very serious issue. Um, and they're demanding police protection for not just uh, Gurdwaras but also Mandiris as well. So it's uh, an issue that's been developed. We talked about it last week, um, some attacks that took place in Gurdwara uh, in India, um, and this time it's Pakistan. So this is obviously going to develop, and we've seen over the, the week in social media it's developed into quite a major story. And for us it's a, it's a major cause for concern because um, we are a very small minority um, in Pakistan. Um, but on a slightly kind of a positive spin. I don't know, maybe the timing of this is quite questionable, but 
questionable, but uh, Guru Nanak's uh, Gurpurab has now been uh, accepted as an official public holiday by the, the, the Punjab government in Pakistan. Okay, so, yeah, so I don't know, maybe. Do we have that kind of thing in India? I don't um, know. Yeah, in Punjab, it's a, a state a holiday, um, okay. but not, uh, not in India. I mean, not India as a country has three national yeah, holidays, yeah, yeah, right. but in Punjab, it is. Um, yeah. Interesting. It, it always reminds me that you know when you start talking about Punjab in Pakistan, you kind of forget it. It's always become yeah, because it's split up, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. But always that when when you start talking about the Punjabi Sikhs that live there, yeah, yeah it's uh, absolutely. And I, I guess you know if we think about it from a partition perspective, you know there were many uh, Gurdwara that were left behind actually in the Pakistan area. Um, I think I read somewhere something about the fact that you know they really need to consider whether or not the people that look after it really can look after it. You know. Yeah. Uh, I don't know who they are. Are they a, a mix of different people, local people as well as Sikhs that live there? Yeah, there's a, there are a few organizations in Pakistan, but uh, many Sikhs don't really travel to Pakistan unless they go on a yatra of the Gurdwara. And okay. um, I think we don't really get involved. I mean, remember in the Ardas and Gurdwara, you know, Gurdwara Pantso Vishri Gehe. So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of sad, really. Yeah, and I think the, uh, the incident uh, rate is increasing, uh, especially in Sindh, I think. Literally, there have been seven incidents uh, very recently as well. So, and that's a, there's a, a section within the uh, the actual law called Section 295-A, uh, which actually uh, involves the registration of cases uh, and miscreants as well. Now, let's move to the other side of the world in terms of uh, across the pond, as they say, uh, New York. Uh, we find that a Sikh rights group has challenged the dismissal of the 1984. Uh, rights violation against the Congress Party uh, before an appeal court. Uh, it says that uh, apparently it was uh, of concern that it's, uh, and it's something known as institutional uh, standing to seek judgment on behalf of the Sikh community. The case filed under the Sikhs for Justice, known as the SFJ, was dismissed by Judge Robert Sweet of the US District Court last month on the grounds that the group failed to show sufficient touch and concern to the United States. Now, it's an interesting point, I think, because um, I think when you look at religion, it's not just uh, a religion in a country, a religion across the world, isn't it? I mean, yeah. you could be a Sikh living in, in America, or you could be a Sikh living in the United Kingdom. Um, it's not necessarily country-bound, is it? Exactly. But it does mean that uh, there's a connection there, and they have an identification with an issue that, it, that involves that community, yeah. whether it be 30 years or not. Uh, and I'm not sure whether the judge actually understood what that actually meant to the individuals who are bringing it, who happen to be Sikhs, who have that's that connection. Fantastic. Yeah, that's a fantastic point. And I think that's something that um, is very hard for people that aren't part of the Sikh community to understand. And it, we, we're so interconnected as a community. It's mm. uh, all our issues that we share um, across the globe are so similar when it comes to Pantic stuff. So it's uh, it's uh, very interesting. It's, it's hard. I mean, I, I, Christians, I don't know. I don't know if they have that kind of connection or do they have those kind of issues that they, they face in the challenges. They're connected to is. Bethlehem, aren't they? Yeah. You know, I mean, if, um, you know, they still know about the, the birthplace of Jesus yeah. and, and they would hope that, you know, that would be respected as a, a location. They don't want, if anything, anybody, you know, God forbid anything ever happened in that area, they'd still have a connection there. They'd still want to yeah. seek international justice for anything that happened to, to them. Yeah. I mean, if you look at Jewish community, you know, we have uh, sought, you know, from a Jewish perspective, um, a fight against fascism, a fight against yeah. the fact that so many millions of Jews actually died. They had to die in Germany in concentration camps. Um, they still held responsible the people that had moved from uh, Germany yeah. and were living in hiding. And there were still court cases against those individuals, although they may have lived in uh, the United States for many years, they still have uh, something to answer for yeah. if they've been involved in concentration camps. I think if they were ex-Nazi yeah. officers, yeah. for example. You know, you give a 90-year-old, you're still taking to prison. Yeah. If he's, if he's, you know, look at the cases that are going on at the moment uh, where people have been accused for things and they still bring them back even after the cases are 20 years old. Yeah. yeah. I think, you know, when it comes to law, it's so technical. And I think this particular thing is the Alien uh, Torts Act or the, a yeah, alien, the ATS. Yeah. yeah, the Alien Tort Statutes. Yeah. So it's a, it's a national law that I don't know the jurisdiction of that, um, how it applies with other countries. It gets really messy with the, when it comes to law and yeah. legalities. It, you know, the, the, uh, the uh, geography is, plays such an important part. Well, we have that. a lot of lawyers that are Sikhs yeah. as well, so they can understand it and maybe kind of articulate yeah. that. Anyway. So let's uh, let's move on to. Um, the, actually, I tell you what, you had some more uh, information. Yeah, I forgot to, to, you were talking about it earlier on. There's a load of stuff that's going on. Yeah, there, so there's um, some really fantastic news this week. The yeah. Canadian Museum for Human Rights 
Um, there's a, a group of Sikh activists in Canada that have been working with the museum, um, and it's taken them over three years. Um, but it's a museum, it's a human rights museum, and they're going to feature a display called We Are the Light that's going to be about just one Singh Kala, Shaheed just one Singh Kala, and his mission to seek justice for the uh, victims and uh, accountability. Um, for those that suffered um, under Indian state violence. So that's a fantastic thing and this display that's going to be in the Canadian Museum for Human Rights um, is, is going to grow and grow and it's going to feature more stories and information about 1984 um, and it's quite poignant that it's happened at the 30 year mark so it's some a piece of a fantastic piece of news and um, it shows how well and how integrated um, the Canadian Sikh community is and hopefully uh, we can see something like that in the UK as well um, and have some kind of uh, remembrance and some commemoration uh, for the events of uh, 1984. It, it, interesting as well, I think there's a stamp that's about to be issued in Canada as well. Yeah, isn't that's there? a, a Komagata Maru, um, right. yeah, the tanker that was issued, so that's, um, that's another fantastic piece of um, okay. news that's happening. Do, you know, do well. you know about that history? Do you want to tell us a little bit about what that was about? So it's, uh, it was a boat coming over from um, uh, India um, that had some immigrants on there, and they were refused to dock. Uh, well, they fired upon, weren't they? Yeah, yeah. they were fired upon, some, some of them died. So yeah. um, it's, a, it's a very tragic story. Um, but so interesting that today the regiment that was commanded to fire upon them, um, their commanding officer is a Sikh today. So, oh, wow, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. Now, there's cynics that might turn around and say, there, there were two aspects to it. This is well, really the, good that yeah. the Canadian Parliament have apologised for that. That took place a yeah. uh, hundred years ago. I think they're commemorating it by a stamp. Uh, that's coming out. I think you can get choice of stamps when you uh, go online. You can get them uh, posted to you, yeah. um, which is amazing to have that. Um, obviously, uh, based around a sad set of uh, circumstances, um, the cynics might suggest that the uh, British Columbia, which has a very large Sikh community, uh, Sikh contingent, I should say, in terms of voting power, yeah. is that, do you think, I mean, people might say it was actually appeasing them so that they can actually vote for them, it's or the is it thing. a genuine, yeah. if you look at it on a positive perspective, is it a genuine uh, apology and a genuine recognition of an yeah. event in history that took place um, and they feel, uh, meaning the actual uh, majority party that are there, feeling it's very important to respect uh, their heritage, uh, their yeah. Canadian heritage. Cynics could say the same thing um, when um, uh, Cameron comes on TV and celebrates Vasaki and gives Vasaki messages and um, the same thing in uh, Pakistan uh, when they're passing legislation to accept Gurunanak's Gurpurb as a public holiday. Okay. So we, we, can, we can look on cynics or yeah. we can actually say it's a positive thing that at least there's recognition and there's a recognition about something uh, that yeah. is very important. You know? Yeah, I mean it, it could be done in a cynical vein but it's up to us to take, like you said, to take the positive out of it Absolutely. Um, and look at it as a cause of commemoration. Okay, well let's take a break for a second and just kind of summarise what we've been doing in this particular programme. We've just been through a set of um, historical events associated with Sikhs, but more around Sikh news uh, from around the world. Uh, we were talking earlier on about the Nigerian situation uh, in terms of the global news and in terms of UK specific or major headline uh, which affects, for example, the UK, France, Denmark, India, the rise of uh, the right wing, which is uh, very worrying. Let's move into the final part of the programme where we uh, again refer to uh, the expertise of uh, Shimshir, but looking at uh, Sikh history, what actually happened if we, we look back, what can we consider as uh, this week in history? So it's actually really interesting, um, the events as I was looking up, um, the events that happened in history um, this week. So in 1886, uh, Dalip Singh, um, the last surviving heir to the uh, empire, the Sikh empire of Punjab, Ranjit Singh's son, um, was in aid in France um, receiving Khande de Paul uh, Amrit um, and trying to reconnect with his Sikh heritage and previously had been in England and um, he had been effectively anglicized um, and he was baptized as a Christian. Um, so it's really uh, interesting that that's happening this week in the same week um, that in 1960 the Punjabi uh, Subha Morcha was taking place um, where tens of thousands of Sikhs, uh, our um, grandmothers, grandfathers, um, our ancestors um, voluntarily courted arrest for the right to speak Punjabi in Punjab uh, after partition. So um, it's uh, two very strong links throughout mm. the history. Um, and on this week, on Friday, on uh, Sikh Channel on Panth Time, we'll be talking more about Anglo-Sikh heritage and Sikh institutions um, on Friday evening. So check that out. It's That's really interesting, interesting. Actually, if you, if you just a, a couple of points on that. First of all, you know, 1947 being the year that India got its freedom. You know, 13 years later, 
you know, there's kind of like, you know, having to fight for the fact that you can speak Punjabi. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, if, you, if we look back in history, we'll see that, you know, Nehru uh, at the time had uh, changed his mind about the commitments that he had made uh, when it came to talking to Master Dara Singh about whether or not there'd be greater autonomy within that particular state. Uh, mm -hmm. He said something like, things are different now. Um, also, you know, it's, it's interesting that, that the whole kind of, uh, you know, what's happening in, uh, in the world, we see that, you know, we, we were talking earlier on about the, the Sikh community itself. Um, you know, there's, there's a recognition that there's a lot of positive um, aspects of, uh, you know, celebrating different things around the world, you know. Yeah. Uh, and we don't, as a community, uh, in terms of our history, because uh, recently in the um, national curriculum, there's been a revisit uh, to looking at the, uh, for example, there's a new syllabus that's coming out that's looking at the Mughal Empire. Um, but there doesn't seem to be, in my view, uh, a recognition of parallel history. So, you know, when somebody's doing something in the UK, in terms of 100 years ago or 200 years ago, what was happening in India? What was happening in China? You know, and, you know, if you look at the story of Dalip Singh, it is fascinating in terms of the connection that it has to the royal family. When he came over to the UK, um, he was converted, and he was the mm. last, last Maharaja of Punjab. He was converted to Christianity, and uh, when he tried to make his move back, there's, you should read a book by uh, Kirsty Campbell that looks at this. When you ever get an opportunity, if you are in the UK and you go to the Isle of Wight, go to Osborne House because she was the Emperor of India at the time, but she never went to India. But she had a great relationship with uh, uh, Maharaja Dalip Singh, and she, there's little watercolours out uh, the way, where she's done. But if you go to the Durba room, you'll see that it's decorated in very much a kind of architecture of India. So my point I'm saying here is that we don't celebrate all the aspects of the rich culture that we have, and we don't necessarily have that reflected in the way that we teach our children in a general syllabus at school uh, about these historic events that I think that if we did that more, we'd be a better connected society. You know, if you knew more about the fact that it's been hundreds of years ago that, you know, there were Sikhs here, there were people that were, uh, for example, the uh, recent BBC Two programme that looked at uh, the East India Company, People used to go from here to uh, India and they used to adopt the local lifestyle in during the Victorian era. So there seems yeah. to be almost a kind of like a, well, you know, that's them and then that's us now. And we, that, we've done the same thing. We've come here and adopted the local lifestyle as yeah, well. Absolutely, there's a fusion. But, you know, but when it comes down to, you know, we were talking about the, the right wing right at the beginning, yeah. there isn't an acceptance that fusion is better sometimes in terms of understanding who we are and, and you know, mm -hmm. why are there so many Indian restaurants in the UK? Yeah. Because people love the food, don't they? You know? Yeah. That reminds me of a, a video I was watching. Um, it was a, a parody video of a, um, it was a happy tune by a, a Pharrell Williams, I believe. Uh, absolutely. And uh, the guy's, uh, I think he called it Packy. And in the end, the, the racist uh, car uh, guy that was the kind of antagonist of the video is in a restaurant ordering uh, chicken curry. Uh, so it's really quite funny to yeah. say, even as a, a racist uh, guy that he was portrayed, his favorite food was, uh, you know, um, foreign okay. food. Right. Uh, this is quite an interesting, in interesting juxtaposition. Yeah, interesting situation. Yeah. Okay, well, that's it for this time round. We hope you enjoyed the show in its four parts where we looked at uh, a main headline, we looked at uh, world news, we looked at seat news, and then now we've just been discussing uh, aspects of history. Specifically, we were talking about uh, Dalip Singh, uh, which is very interesting indeed, and uh, give you uh, a strong recommendation to go online, uh, to go to your local library, find out more about Osborne House, about Queen Victoria, find out more about... Uh, the history of Sikhs uh, and if you have an opportunity maybe you should contact uh, educational boards who are looking at uh, publishing the new uh, syllabus for teaching uh, GCSE uh, history and uh, unless we talk about it and say this is important to when you're talking about the Mughal Empire the importance of the Sikhs in terms of uh, you know, making sure that that ethnic cleansing campaign was destroyed uh, by, you know, we destroyed that as Sikhs, so that's a very powerful thing to include in the syllabus uh, for greater understanding for all communities. So, uh, it's goodbye from me, and uh, uh, we wish you all the best until we see you again. Uh, keep on listening to the news, and if you've got any feedback, please send it to us at the channel. Until next time, <laughs>